Hey, hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Barnes and Noble ticketed event. Uh, I am so excited to be here. I'm Devon Franklin. I am your host tonight. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a producer, I'm an author, and I am a student of, of this man. Uh, he has a new book today. It has dropped today. It's called Don't Drop the Mic. The Power of Your Words Can Change the World. None other than one of the greatest communicators on the planet, Bishop T.D. Jakes. How are you doing, my brother? I'm good. I'm great. I'm privileged to talk to you. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. No, I, the honor is mine. So, you know, we have people tuning in from all around the world who have uh, pre-ordered and bought your book and bought a signed copy. And we're so excited that you are here tonight. We are so excited you're here. Uh, we can see all of you virtually. So, you know, Bishop, I've known you now for, oh my goodness, going on uh, over a decade, probably yeah. going on close to 15 years. And, you know, when I sat down with, with Kirk, I said something. When I sat down with Steph Curry, I said something. And I'm going to say the same thing to you, which okay. is, I know you are as humble as you are great. Wow. I know that. But Thank tonight, I don't want to talk to the humble Bishop T.D. Jakes. <laughs> I need everyone here. There, there are some people here who have come because they are struggling in their gift of communication. And you have written this book. And I feel honored because years ago, I had the privilege of driving you to the airport. Um, and I had a chance to pick your brain on so many of the topics that are in this book about how to communicate and how to become more effective in your gifting. So I really want to unpack it tonight so that someone in this ticketed event can get something that can propel and or change their life because they've been struggling with their gift of communication. So the first thing I wanna start with is just what, what was the inspiration behind this book? Because I was shocked when I saw this book because you reveal your secrets. And I said, Bishop, <laughs> Talk to me. This is like, you know, KFC telling everybody what's what's in the secret seasoning. So <laughs> give us the understanding of what inspired you and motivated you to write this. Well, to be honest with you, it was probably one of the most difficult uh, books to write that I have ever written to try to articulate something that is in part spiritual and uh, in part a result of your own experiences because we bring all of our experiences into the way we communicate to articulate it in a way that it would be transferable was quite intimidating. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Frank Thomas, uh, who has spent years studying African-American preaching, uh, convinced me that it would be a travesty for me to live and die and not leave some written work that attempts to articulate that process. In the process of writing the book, though, the pandemic came, uh, the racial tensions flared up, and the tenor of the book began to take on a national discussion, mm -hmm. and then to narrow down to not just a national sociological economic understanding of how we live together as citizens of the globe, but down to the individual levels of how we communicate for a job, for a staff meeting with a son, with a daughter, with a wife. We tell couples to communicate, but we don't tell them how difficult communication actually is. And uh, so I try to uh, leave some, uh, some clues that would help people to become more articulate. And express. It's not, it's not just about vocabulary. It is the ability to, to find words to paint the abstract feelings that we are having or the Bible character is going through or the, the people that we're talking to are going through to be able to articulate whether it's pain, love, pleasure, forlornment, frustration, intimidation, insecurity, to find the words to get that out and to ventilate the soul is what we are tackling and don't drop the mic. Mm, I love it. I love it. And, and you know, there's so many tips uh, on what you're articulating right now in the book, you know, about how to be able to communicate in so many different ways and on so many different levels. You know, one of the things that dawned on me as I was going through the book, which is, what is your gift for, it seems like your gift of communication was natural. 
uh, is that is that assumed or did you really have to work at becoming the the communicator you are today well first of all i never thought i was any good <laughs> um, yeah, I never thought I was any good, which, uh, you know, uh, which it turned out to be my greatest asset because I didn't make the mistake of, of praying to be bigger. Instead, I prayed to be better. Amen. So, so uh, if you get better, bigger will take care of itself. Mm. And so, you know, that, that humility that you described is not a forced religious humility. Uh, it is an inability to see oneself mm. because I can see the world around me, but I can never see me. Mm. So uh, there's always a certain question mark amongst the sensible, the rational people uh, as to am I enough? It makes you study harder, makes you prepare more, uh, makes you not take the crowd for granted makes you not take the opportunity for granted. And then what happened to me, Devon, that I tried to cover in the book is it wasn't just about preaching. I also had to be able to articulate in a boardroom, in a business meeting, to negotiate for film, for production, to get, uh, to be able to deal with the cast or staff or crew uh, or wife or child. And I found myself going into so many different uh, sociological constructs from meeting with CEOs about business deals to sitting with Larry King or Oprah Winfrey or being a guest of presidents and kings and, and walking into so many different streams of consciousness that I had to develop the ability to be what I call bilingual in the book. Yeah. And, I, and I only speak one language, <laughs> but, but that language has so many children there's a different language in entertainment than there is in business. There's a different language in business than there is in preaching. And a lot of times we bring old languages into new situations and don't understand why we are rejected. And it's because we're speaking a foreign language mm -hmm. and therefore become by, by default an immigrant in a culture that only embraces its own. Yeah. And, and what you want to do is to be able to learn the language of the room even if it means being quiet for a while before you speak so that you can speak in such a way that you are heard and understood and embraced in the community for which your gift has brought you into because your gift will bring you into great rooms and before kings and princes mm -hmm. and beyond the parameters of where you start. But the question becomes, can you stay in the room once you get in the room and do you have the flexibility and the dexterity of thought and the nimbleness of mind to be able to grow as a person to the depths and the lengths of what your purpose is and what your opportunities have created for you. Mm, wow, wow. I have so much that I want to unpack from this. Well, first of all, uh, I don't know if the panelists, if y'all got access to the chat, but we just let's just turn this into Barnes and Noble Baptist for a minute. Go ahead in the chat and just go ahead and respond because Bishop is just dropping already so many gems what we know is he's never dropped the mic and we're all so grateful for that. Um, what you just hit on actually dovetailed with a, a passage in the book that I wanna read, um, which I thought was very interesting. It's on page 102, you write this. As I traveled to very address various audiences, I quickly learned it's not enough to connect with the substance of my message and ignore how my audience will receive it. Without studying my intended audience, I would miss synergistic points of connectivity. Knowing as much as possible about my audience is integral to my delivery. First of all, I completely agree, 1000%. And a lot of times where people miss it is they miss the miss who their audience is. You're right. You know, I mean, Bishop, I, listen, you know, I've spoken a lot. I'm, I'm gonna tell you this, I wish I had read this before I spoke at Catalyst. <laughs> oh man. I go into Catalyst to speak it. For those of you who don't know what Catalyst is, Catalyst is a, a, it's a pretty well-renowned uh, uh, you know, uh, conference for speakers and, and you know, orators from around the world. Long story short, they're a little conservative. So I go in there, not even thinking about the audience, only thinking about my message. Do you know, crickets. <laughs> Cause I'm coming out with all this energy and it's yeah. crickets. Okay. Yeah. So how did you discover this? Because every 
every time I've been around you and we've, we've been in a lot of different circles where this from business circles to being on movie sets to being in service, there's a lot of different ways we've connected and you always understand your audience. How did you get to know that this was something that was critical in order to communicate effectively? Actually not from preaching, from doing interviews. Mm. There's a great deal of difference between doing an interview on a hip hop station to doing an inter interview on a conservative news station and how you, you, you don't deviate on who you are, but you might deviate on how you explain yourself based on the ears of those who are going to hear you. And I think uh, this is a very important thing for you to understand. Uh, it's true in the movie business, you have to have an audience. You can't be all things to all people. Mm. Uh, it is also true in interviews and it's also true in speaking. By the way, I spoke for Catalyst too. And, uh, and it was a great experience, but a very interesting atmosphere. And I think if you're gonna grow beyond the pond that you were spawned in, you have to have the, uh, the ability to study your audience. The, the other thing that I want to, to quickly respond to that I think is very important. When you come from a church background, sometimes the metrics by which you measure success is response. But there are many, many settings, like when I was speaking in, in Kiev, nobody said anything the whole time I was speaking. And you have to have enough confidence in your material and awareness of the culture of your people that you don't expect things from them that are not the metrics that they use to express, express yeah. gratitude. That's when good. I made the, the altar call, they erupted. You know, <laughs> the, the, the altar call was flooded. But all while I was talking, it was their nature to listen. And uh, I like to get in and feel the room and feel the atmosphere. Uh, and I use the metaphor of cooking, you know, throughout yeah. the book, comparing cooking with speaking. Yeah. And the oven has to be preheated before you bake the bread. And so to feel the temperature of the room and adjust yourself accordingly is a wise thing for a speaker to do, whether you're speaking to your wife <laughs> Amen to that. Amen to that. Come on. You know, <laughs> or, or whether, you know, is she depressed? Is she in a good mood? Is she excited? Where is her head at? Or whether you are speaking uh, at a collegiate setting at a university to a, a group of academians, uh, or whether you are speaking to a group who, who have been through trauma and meeting people where they are is communication. Because if you articulate and you speak something that is not received. Communication is not just speaking. It is also their ability to receive, understand, and comprehend what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So to a degree, if you don't get it over to the audience and deliver it effectively, you have failed as a communicator, even though you may have been quite articulate. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, understanding the different metrics, understanding the different audiences, and growing to the size of the room you're in, that's what fish do in a fish tank. They grow to the size of the, of the tank you put them in. Many species of fish, if you put them in a small tank, they won't get as big if, if you put them in a large one. And so you grow to the size of the opportunities that are afforded you. And that's why you don't want big dates prematurely because mm -hmm. it's better to grow into it than to be thrust into something that you're really not ready for. Mm, wow, amen to that. You know, speaking of, of ready, were you more prepared to grow as a speaker uh, on stage or in the pulpit or at home? Meaning, which communication has been harder to master? The interpersonal communication, you know, with first lady or your children or the communication to the masses? I think that there is more to be lost through your interpersonal relationships. Mm -hmm. Explain they, that. That's really, I love that thought. Explain that. They're more important. Mm -hmm. Your children, your wife are going to be with you to the grave. Mm -hmm. And there's more to be lost if you lose them. And it's devastating. And, and it's very, very important that you win the ability to speak and to earn uh, their respect and for you to respect that audience and to be able to win there is critical and difficult because the currency of emotion often clouds the communication 
and makes it more difficult than it is to speak to an audience that is nebulous and indescript and has nothing to do with you long term. Uh, yet we tend to put more energy into speaking to the people with whom we have no real relationship than we do in speaking to the people who are going to be with us the rest of our lives. And I think that you want to be able to do both effectively. And that's why I tackle both in the book. The book starts out talking about me sitting at home, watching my father watch Dr. Martin Luther King deliver an address back in the 60s. And I was amazed by Dr. King's oratorical ability but what really blew me away was looking at how my father looked at him because mm -hmm. my father was my hero. And so if my hero was impressed, I was impressed. Right. And immediately at the age of about six, I realized that a microphone can bring about more change than a gun ever will. Mm. And while we load up back to the points of being almost like the wild, wild west uh, in conflict, we don't seem to understand that major transition in our sociological environment has been achieved more through the microphone than it has through the handgun. Yeah, absolutely, without a doubt. I mean, speaking of microphone, um, I don't mean to deviate, but I'm gonna come right back. What's interesting is that your uh, logo, you know, has always been, you know, with the, the word and, and the microphone. Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting is that there was there were so many that came before you and knowing you, I know that you, you've always paid homage to from whence you have come. Yes. And, and why was it so important for you as the microphone was being passed to you to not drop it yourself? We are the sum total of all that we have heard and seen. No one arrives here by themselves. The truth of the matter is this chair I'm sitting in is so full it, it could almost break. My grandparents are sitting here. My ancestors are sitting here. My, my, my former pastors are sitting here. Every comedian I've ever listened to, every orator I've ever listened to, every litigator I've ever listened to make a closing statement before a jury has taught me something about mm -hmm. speech. You don't just learn everything you need by studying the manual or the Bible or whatever it is you're going to speak from. Everybody can teach you something about the art of speaking. Speaking of Bible, the Bible does say, let him that minister, minister according to his ability, not anointing, ability. Mm -hmm. You can have more anointing than you have ability. <laughs> but the, yeah, but the good thing again. about ability is ability can be gendered, it can be strengthened, it can be flexed, it can grow. We all have the same amount of muscles in the body, but they're not the same size because some of us work on them more than others. And so you can get better, mm. but today we're worried about getting bigger, much more so than we are getting better. Mm. And as, as the mic is passed to you, if you get bigger and you don't get better, you will lose bigger. Mm. Wow. If, <laughs> if I give you a 10,000 seat room and a 10,000 seat opportunity, but you have a 1,000 seat capacity, mm. 9,000 people will leave. If I put you in a room with 1,000 and you have a 10,000 capacity, you'll grow the 1,000 to 10. Wow. So, so what we should do is not focus on the size of the platform, but the depth of our ability to master whatever stage we are on mm -hmm. to the degree that we are successful at communicating, whether the audience says yes or no, you can make a good pitch and still not get the deal. That's right. That's a fact. Absolutely. You, you understand what I'm saying? 1, so the response of the audience doesn't mean that you failed to be effective at making the pitch. Just because you're rejected doesn't mean you're not valuable. And so mm -hmm. we can't afford to allow our self-esteem to hang on the hinge of other people's reaction. Yeah. And yet it is important to us to make sure that we are understood, even if their answer is no, that we have effectively articulated our position and our case. Your no might be for a reason that has nothing to do with my presentation, but it's my job to make sure that my presentation is not a hindrance mm. to your reception. Oh my goodness! Right, <laughs> this I cannot wait for everybody. See, I, I already got the copy. I got the advanced copy, so I'm excited. I can't wait for everybody on this Zoom in this live event with Barnes and Noble. I can't wait for you to read this book. 
what he's giving you right now is truly just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much knowledge in this book that's going to change uh, your communication ability, understand what communication means. And this is just a little bit. Uh, something that I want to articulate, we're gonna, then we're going to go to some Q&A that have uh, questions that have been submitted. Um, in the book on page 387, uh, you tell this story. Uh, and I want to I uh, read it very quickly. And here is the, the, the story that, that's written. Uh, there's an old story where a young preacher came to an old preacher. Old, old preacher was retired and gone fishing. Young preacher came down to old preacher and says, I can't believe I caught you by yourself. I love everything you preach. I've heard everything you've preached. The old man kept fishing because he didn't want to be bothered. He came out there to get away from all this. The young boy kept bothering him and bothering him and bothering him. The old man wouldn't say anything to him, thinking, maybe if I don't say anything, he'll go away. Finally, the old man put down the rod and the reel, and he grabbed the boy and snatched him and threw him in the lake. The boy couldn't slim, swim, and he's gurgling. This is on page 388. He's gurgling the noise, going under the water, drinking water and all he could drink. And about the third time he's going down about to die, the old man reached in and snatched him out of the water. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? I was trying to talk to you, the young boy said. Why did you do that? The young preacher asked. He said, shut up, listen to me. He said, you remember when you took that last breath and how bad you wanted it? That's how bad you have to want it. And he went back to fishing. My, 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 Bishop Jakes. First of all, that story gets me excited. Second of all, you, you, why did you want to get better so badly? Because we're, we're probably on your 40th book and that may be an understatement. Like there's something in you that wants, it's not about bigger, it's never been about bigger with you, it's been about better. Why do you, or why are you so committed to getting better and why do you want it so badly? I think that uh, God is attracted to us, to uh, our void not our fullness. And uh, it is the hunger that drives the narrative. If you really want to, he that hungers and thirsts shall be filled. Uh, that's the spiritual answer. The natural and practical answer is, I don't like to do anything I'm not good at. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you on that. <laughs> You know, I, I, I would do a recording album like the Winans, but I can't sing like them. Okay. But you got to That's the only reason I can do it. A little bit. You got a good baritone. I've heard it. A little bit, a little bit. But, but, but I don't. And, and you have to realize that you are not going to be good at everything. So narrowing your focus down to what are the two or three things that I feel like I have the seed of greatness, the potential of greatness to be birthed and germinated in me is important. There are many things I like, I love music, but I don't have the enough seed in music mm. to grow it to greatness. And that requires honesty with oneself. Mm. And that is something that we are not taught to do. We're so busy encouraging people that we don't tell them the truth. A good mentor should tell you the truth. You are not a good actor, mm. but you're a great singer. Come on. You should be singing. You know, sometimes you need a little guidance to, to find out where do I put my energy and my effort to be ultimately effective. And so for me, speaking was a part of it. Writing was a part of it. Uh, I'm a storyteller. Yes, you are. Yeah, I'm a storyteller. My ancestors were storytellers. My mother used to sit around and tell stories. I used to tell stories to my kids, uh, 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 scary stories. It's, it scared them to death <laughs> with the lights off and a flashlight in my face, telling them stories late at night. I'm a storyteller and I can embody the character. It is one thing to preach, and I talk about this in the book. It is one thing to talk about blind Bartimaeus sitting by the highway side begging. And it's another thing to feel the dusty sand beneath your your body as the sand presses into your body weight and to hear the approaching sounds of a crowd and not be able to see them and to know in the spirit of desperation that if they walk past you, your one chance at change has mm -hmm. dissipated. Come on. With that fervency and that fear and that intimidation that drives even uh, the introvert to act in the extrovert ways. Mm. He cries out of the silence 
because he does not want his moment to pass him by. Mm. Now, all of that is not written, but all of that is there in yeah. the text. If you extrapolate it, if you become the character, you embody the feelings that made him cry out, even in the face of being rejected by those around him, and to override them and insist upon being heard because he has a desperate reality that help is passing by mm. and it may not ever return again. Wow. That fierce urgency of now that Dr. Martin Luther King talked about drives him to yes. risk being inappropriate rather than to risk being left behind. Mm. And he screams out, hey, thou son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. Oh, that I might receive. This is the cry of desperation. It yes. is not enough for you to tell the story if you cannot explain what it feels like to be desperate to the point that you behave in a way that is out of character to your background. Mm. <laughs> oh my goodness. Listen, listen, listen. I want to run around this place right now, but I'm not going to do that much. <laughs> I, I know so many watching right now feel the same way. Um, let's transition into some of the Q and A. Uh, there are some questions that have come in. One came in from a millennial and I think this is, uh, I'd love to get your take on this. Here's what they wrote. They said, my generation has access to tons of information via the internet, but we may not have the wisdom or the experience to understand the true context of what we're dealing with in our society. As a general in the faith, what questions sh should our generation be asking that we are not asking? First of all, uh, I celebrate your generation. You are our children. I think you're amazing and incredibly gifted. Uh, what you must understand though, is that respect is never given, it must be earned. And there are some subjects that you might have the information about, but not the respect that earns you the right to address it. Mm. That takes time, that takes evidence, that takes proof. You can't, you can't teach about holding your marriage together if you've only been married three weeks. You can't talk about raising a child when your children are two. That takes time to percolate. So, uh, so grasp subjects from which you have a lived out experience that is big enough to earn you the credibility. I'll give you, a, since we're really two preachers. <laughs> yes. Lazarus did more for Jesus mm. than anybody by dying. He gave his life, but him being raised from the dead gave Christ evidence. There it is. Wow. Yes. Christ, if Christ needed something to point to, to win the respect of his detractors, you have to accomplish it, not just know it in mm. order to win the respect of the greater world in which you are surrounded. And so I, I would say, uh, like in a heavyweight boxing, always fight in your weight class. Yeah. Don't compete with your fathers. Don't compete with people in a heavier weight class. Fight on your weight class. If you're a lightweight, you can still be a winner you, but win on the level that you're on. And, and the premise of that is you want to start greatness in a small room, not a big room. Mm -hmm. Don't rush to the massive stage. Mm -hmm. You know, when we would take plays and we would take them out on tour, we would always start in B markets. We wouldn't start in New York. Right. We might start in Birmingham or Cleveland and work out the mistakes before we got to New York where the criteria is higher and the viewer is more discriminating. Mm. You don't want to rush to New York and go on Broadway because thing. Broadway is a different barometer than Birmingham. Definitely. Let's go to Birmingham. And I'm not saying that they're not discriminating consumers in Birmingham, but let's go to Birmingham where they're just glad to have a play and work out the kinks there in Mobile or in Selma or in Utah somewhere and then grow 
into a large, the, the whole misfortune of the prodigal son is not that he got something that wasn't going to be his, but he got it prematurely. Yes. And so if you get what's yours prematurely, you will always waste it. Mm. Timing is everything, even in speaking. The, the speaking in, in the book, I talk about speaking as a rhythm. It's, a, it's like music, it has a rhythm, it has a flow, it has a tone, it has a pitch. It goes up and down and in and out and it, it flexes itself in many, many, many different ways. Your voice is an instrument. Mm -hmm. It's not a computer, this is the third day of the month. <laughs> you know, it, it, it has range and pitch and depth and, and you, you have to learn your instrument you have to learn how to flow in your instrument and you want to do that in a small room. Our country is trying to have a great conversation, but we're trying to have it on a massive stage and it's a difficult, painful conversation about race. So there we are taking on thousands of people on Facebook, but we didn't talk to our neighbor across the street. Yeah. Start at Starbucks and have a cup of coffee with somebody who looks different, votes different and thinks different and try out your ideas before you put them on the bigger stage of Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you have to do damage control mm. to retract the atrocity of premature uh, ejaculation mm -hmm. of, of a substance that has not really been percolated by experience and time. Mm. Wow, wow, and I can, I can say to whoever, the millennial was that asked this question that what you're saying bishop you're not just answering it you that's literally your that's the that's what you how you always speak I, i'll never forget which i'm like years ago might have been 10 years ago you know i was you know I'm, i've been always been preaching on the side and doing different things but always have been you know an executive and been in hollywood and i'll never forget I was telling you about a transition I was uh, getting ready to take on and I was so excited. Oh, you know, I get a chance to, you know, write more books and speak and do all this stuff. And you called me the next day and you said, the same light that illuminates is the same light that burns. Yes. Once you go through that door of like the door of notoriety, the door of fame, you mm -hmm. can't go back through it. Right. So you were very, what you're saying right now is so true because you gave me this message saying, hey, you, you can only go through that door once and you got to make sure you know why you're going through that door and you got to be intentional. Don't just get out there because you like the light. Yeah. Because that light's going to burn you. So I appreciate this truth you're sharing tonight because it, I pray that anyone watching right now gets the message because what you're saying is not just an answer to a question. It's literally the philosophy you've lived by for so long. I love what you said because I have always poured into younger people. Always. Be, always, because I was 19 when I started preaching. I was 22 when I started pastoring. I was 24 when I got married. I was 38 when I moved to Dallas. I was on national television at 33. So even though I'm in my 60s now, I have a love for young people because a lot of my experiences began being the younger generation trying to measure up to the older generation standard mm. because yesterday I was the millennial of yesterday. Yes. So I deeply can relate to the starvation for mentoring. And I wrote this book because it is your season, young people. It is your time. Absolutely. This is your moment. I mean, right now, not fixing to be right now is your moment. Our generation is moving into the autumn and the winter of our lives. It is the spring and the summer of your life. And so when I say don't drop the mic, it's because the mic is being passed. Mm -hmm. And as it's passed to you, with it comes more than speaking engagements and opportunities. It comes responsibility to navigate community crisis, sociological crisis, social justice issues public relation areas, you have to be broader than your degree. You have to be broader than your job. You have to be broader than your ministry. You have to be broad enough to tackle tough issues and to know when to leave certain issues alone, okay? Because you don't, you don't, you don't swing at every ball that's thrown to you. That's right. 
You, you, you have to, after a while, your opinion has no value if you throw it around all the time and you have to wait to that, that right moment. And when that bat hits that ball and that cracking sound rings through the whole stadium and it's a high fly ball and, and you can walk around the bases if you wait for the right time. Yes, timing is everything. Um, you know, and speaking of time, I'm mindful of it. There are some questions that have come in. Another question I want to ask you. I'm very curious to get your thought on this one. How do you learn to communicate when you or the situation is emotional? How do I speak the truth with love without being seen as harsh or blunt or hurtful? It depends on to whom you are speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, first of all, I would want to know who, who you're speaking to. And, and, and I think that speaking the truth with love only works when the person is convinced that you love them. <laughs> okay. You better say that. That is so true. <laughs> you don't get to speak the truth with love to a stranger because you haven't earned the right to correct a child you didn't raise. Mm. So if you're if if you're you're speaking the truth is done without having invested in me enough to win the right to correct me, then sometimes less is more. And and to understand that I will not accept what you have to say until I believe that you love me when you said it. That you have to earn that. You have to earn that. And, and what we have now is people just spouting out things and they say, I'm speaking the truth in love and you're a bull in a china shop with not enough glue to glue back the damage that the bull left behind. Mm. Let's let love go first and build the relationship. In the book, I talk about the greatest equity you can have is relationship. It's your biggest resource. And if you don't develop the relationship, the critique will bring resentment. And then yeah. it becomes a contest of wit and, and clap back. And, and, and the consequences can be devastating and you can turn a tremor into an earthquake if you don't earn the right to speak into my life like that. Who says you have the right to speak anything to me in love or out of love if you have not shown that you first loved me. That's why Jesus said, uh, if a man is cold, give him a coat, not a scripture. Uh, if he's hungry, give him food, not right. a sermon. Because in so doing, you earn the right to continue the relationship and open up the conversation. Mm -hmm. Jesus does not bring up the woman at the well's infidelity until way over in the conversation. He comes and talks about water. He talks about thirst. He talks about worship. He builds a foundation for the truth to sit on. And I think sometimes we throw the truth, but the truth is like a house that's built on sand. If it doesn't have the foundation of the investment in my overall well-being, then you, you don't get to correct me just because you're a teacher. We have, not, we have many teachers, but not many fathers. If you prove you're a father, then your chastisement is corrective and not just criticism. Wow, I love that idea. I've never even thought about that concept that you got to build the foundation of love before something can be spoken. You know, before you can give someone some, you know, constructive criticism, so to speak. Right. You have to establish the foundation that you actually care about them, and so often everyone's out here just spouting truth or what yeah. their version of truth with no foundation of love, which is really insightful when you look at what's going on in our culture and community right now and why there's so much you know, vitriol and um, you know, conflict because that foundation of love has not been established. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, another question that came in, Bishop Jakes, how do you keep your resilience during uncertain times? How do you continue to help people when they don't want to help themselves? Where do you find the strength to keep giving despite the noise. You, you, you have to be willing to sow seed regardless of where it falls. Hmm. 
some will fall uh, on the on the rocks and some will fall on good ground and some will be eaten by the birds. You have to understand that. Uh, I don't think sometimes that we are prepared to deal with loss, but loss is a part of winning. And you have to recognize that there are some people, no matter what you do or say, they're not going to change. That should not deter you because they rejected what you had to say. Your job is to sow, just sow, just sow indiscriminately. The sower went forth sowing seed. Some fell by the wayside. Some fell over here, some fell over there. And you have to understand, because if you don't understand that, you're wearing your feelings on your sleeve and my, you need my response to validate who you are. Mm. When in fact, the person may not be responding because of who they are, <laughs> not who you are. Right. Okay? <laughs> and so if the seed could be good, but if it fell on concrete, it's not gonna grow. Right. That doesn't mean I should stop throwing because mm. in the process of throwing, some is gonna fall in the rocks and some is gonna fall in the weeds and some is gonna bring about change. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and that is a part of doing what you do. Not everybody is going to receive you or what you say. And I think it's important that you understand that you build up your tolerance uh, against those who reject you and understand that that goes along with it. I, I often say, and I got this from a friend of mine, but I, I'll pass it on to you. Uh, God will promote you to the level of your tolerance of pain. You, if you can't tolerate the pain, you can't take the promotion. Mm. The problems of the janitor are, are, are on a certain level. He has problems, but they're on a certain level. The mops are not clean. They, they, the mops soured. Uh, they, they didn't wax the floor and it's milky. The problem of the CEO is on another level. And so is the pay. Mm. You get paid on the level of the problems you solve. There it is. There if it is. you run from problems, you run from pay because you are, you are evaluated on your ability to resolve conflicts. And the more you build up the ability to resolve conflict, the more you can grow. But if you can't be faithful over the few, how can you be ruler over the many? And we've got people who are trying to run to the many and they have not been effective with the few. Mm. You, you want to kill the lion and the bear before you face Goliath. You want to do a boardroom before you do a speaking conference. You want to be effective in a, in, a, in a small environment before you go to a big environment. You want to be effective in one location before you open up five locations. Let's not franchise a failing business. Okay, so if the business is going bankrupt, this is not a time to open up 10 locations. Let's master where we are before we proceed to the next dimension of who we can be. And that is process and that is experience. And, and even every failure makes you better. I think yeah. I've learned more from my failures than I have from my successes. And I talk about them in the book. There are many of them. And, and they, each one of them taught me something. None of them left me bankrupt. Every time you fail, you learn something that makes you wiser. You can get knowledge by going to school, but you only get wisdom through having an experience. Mm, you got that right. And I can tell you, you know, uh, there are so many experiences with you that I've gained so much knowledge. Something you said earlier, um, you know, at the beginning of the answer in terms of, you know, you knowing who you are, knowing your voice and not the person receiving it, that may be a reflection of them. You know, I'll never forget, you know, going way back when, um, when I was at Sony and we did Not Easily Broken, you know, which is based upon your book. And that was the first movie for Sony that you produced. Right. We won't get into the particulars, but it was made through a division where the man running the division didn't get you. Right. And it was fascinating for you to, for me to witness you not giving up confidence in what you knew your movies could do. Right. So that movie, it did fine, right? But we knew, you knew it could do more. Right. And because Michael Linton got you, right? right, And you got you, that led to all the films that ultimately, you know, have been done over the years of your See, day. I'm so glad you brought that up because so many people have only seen me in the pulpit. 
You right. have seen me in the boardroom. Yes, you I have guess. seen me in the pitch room. You have seen me back working through the processes of production and, 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 and building up an opportunity to do different things like what you are referring to, like not easily broken, when yes. Kevin Hart wasn't even well known like he is now. Right. Same with Taraji. Taraji Henson. <laughs> we, we, you know, they almost debuted. Uh, yeah. in, in that little film that we did and and to navigate through all of that and still make it home to teach Bible class on Wednesday night and still be able to do a prayer breakfast for the president and still be able to teach staff development for a bank. Mm. I've had such a wide array of experiences that when we start talking about don't drop the mic, it's more than a preacher's manual. It's an orator's manual for every living, breathing, thinking thing. The one thing that separates us from other life forms is language. Mm -hmm. We have it, we write it, we read it, we speak it, and we have produced it for ages. And I start out in the book talking about it. One, at one point in the chapter, I talk about all the languages that died because they were not used, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I'm afraid that we're reducing the artistry of language down to emojis. Mm. We wouldn't have the Gettysburg Address if it had been de delivered in a tweet. <laughs> you got we that. wouldn't have had the I Have a Dream speech had it been delivered in a blurb on, on Instagram. And, and while I love the conveniences of social media, we have dumbed down the artistry and the pageantry of reading, writing, hearing, thinking, language. And we must anchor that and that must pass from generation to generation because part of what makes us distinctive from lower forms of life is speech yes yes and 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 what's interesting you know about the book which covers the power of speech and certainly your insights into how to develop that power but there's a there's an undercurrent which you know our time is almost up but i want you to speak to this there's an undercurrent a fearlessness. You gotta have some level of either uh, fearlessness, craziness, or like just like commitment to be able to communicate because communication is one of the greatest fears most people have. You know, where does that fearlessness that you have, where does it come from? And how do you encourage somebody who's deathly afraid to let use their quickly, gift? Let, let me quickly tell you a story. I grew up uh, in West Virginia, it was 5% African American and 95% Caucasian. Uh, right after Jim Crow, uh, my brother was the first one to go to integrated schools. You can only imagine what the atmosphere was like. He was my hero. He's seven years older than me. I thought he was stronger than an ox. He could beat up anybody. He could handle anything. And we grew up and we got older and he seemed so fearless. And later when we got older, he said, every fight you ever saw me get into, I was scared to death. And I was like shocked. I thought you, you were scared to death. He said, every time you must use the fear for fuel. Mm. It's not that you don't have it, okay. but it makes you prepare better. It makes you study harder. You must use it for fuel. And, and, and I didn't do what I did because I wasn't scared. I did what I did because I refused to let scare, to let fear incarcerate my dreams. Mm. I, I, thought, I thought fear was too minimalistic to be my warden. And mm. I was not willing to be a slave to it. So mm. I feel it. I feel it. It whispers in my ear at night. It, it makes my hands want to shake before I walk out on the stage but I refuse to be ensnared by it. And before I'd be a slave, I'd be dead. And in my grave, I'd rather run out there and fail than stay where it's safe and let fear talk me out of my future. At least mm. I learned something. At least I took a step. At least I got closer to it. I'm, I'm not willing to stay where it's safe and, so, and just merely survive and miss the chance to thrive if I could step over the way I feel mm. to the way I believe. Mm. Whew, my Lord, <laughs> Listen, I, I really hope and pray that everybody watching tonight, that you take these words in, these gems in,
Before we close, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. I just want to remind everybody uh, today, Don't Drop the Mic has come out. Your signed copy will be delivered to you in the next eight to 10 business days. Uh, please also remember that you can get extra copies of Don't Drop the Mic as well as T.D. Jakes, Bishop Jakes' entire backlist. Let me tell you, I personally have a whole library of your books. And I can tell you, without them, I would not be where I am and I would not be who I am. So if you really want your life to go to another level, make sure you not only get extra copies of Don't Drop the Mic, but also on bnm.com and in your local Barnes and Noble store, check out, there's literally like the TD Jake section, okay? <laughs> I mean, literally. So when you talk about, you know, using fear as fuel, clearly you have used it for a tremendous amount of fuel. And one thing I want to say, I mean, listen, I just enjoy our conversations. Very much. Uh, I mean, I'm just, I just, this was when they asked me to do this, I said, oh, I, I, yeah, because it's selfish. Because <laughs> I get so much from you, so thank you. Uh, you know, and I, and I treasure our conversation from a few weeks ago, and it's it's helped me more than I, I can even express. I treasure our relationship. Mm. If there were no relationship, the conversation would not feel like it feels. Yes. And the relationship has been fruitful. It has been longstanding. It has survived many transitions and it is still just as vibrant today as it ever was. I want to say to those that are listening to us, uh, let's build our relationship. Hit me up in Instagram at Bishop Jakes or, or send me a, a, a tweet uh, at Bishop Jakes. I'd love to hear what you thought about the conversation tonight. Uh, I value your perspectives and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Barnes and Nobles, for being a constant source of partnership with me down through the years. Uh, you, we've been allies, we've been friends. I've been at many of the locations and uh, the excellence with which they do things is impeccable. It's a real pleasure. Without a doubt. And Bishop, I'll say this one thing. Uh, you know, I'm a big basketball fan and Steph Curry is one of my favorite, favorite players. And he is currently on a historic run where he has over 10 games where he has scored over 10 three-point shots. Uh, and the, the world is saying how grateful they are to be able to witness the greatest shooter in the history of the NBA play. Wow. We all share a similar feeling about you. We are grateful to witness and to be alive while the greatest communicator is still on the court. Oh, you're just still throwing up shots. We're just grateful to be in the stands and we can say, yes, we were there. We saw, we experienced, we cheered. So thank you for all that you do and letting us all be a part of it. You're making me blush under my blackness. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see it, but I'm turning red under you. Thank you, you're too kind, man. And oh, thank all of you for joining us tonight. Yes, thank you all so much. God bless and uh, have a great night. Take care.